Good afternoon. I'm Cami Abernathy, Dean of the College of Engineering, and it's my great pleasure to have with us this afternoon Mr. Sobroto Bacci, co-founder and chairman of the board of Mindtree. Welcome. Hello. Hello, Cami. Sobroto, what are the characteristics of a great leader? It's, it's very interesting that it hasn't broadly changed over time. Uh, many things about leadership, as we'll discuss later, uh, are changing very dramatically, but this one hasn't changed much. Uh, the first and foremost requirement for a leader is to see a vision. Um, goes back to my most favorite definition of uh, who is a leader, or what is leadership. It came from an American futurologist called Joel Barker. Uh, he puts it beautifully and simply. He says that a leader is a person others opt to follow to go someplace they wouldn't go by themselves. So uh, it, it's very interesting because people opt to follow a leader, which uh, uh, eliminates the idea of coercive leadership. And what it does is it says that people know what is good for them, but somewhere they get caught up in inertia, and then comes the leader, and the leader then has a vision of a future. And that vision, when that leader articulates, she's able to tell people of their true entitlement. And then people pretty much take on the leadership journey. So the first and foremost requirement for a leader is to see a vision which others are not seeing, even if it is their entitlement. Then the job of the leader is to actually create a vision community. Because it's not enough for the leader to know what the future is going to be like. Ultimately, people must own that future. So building a vision community is very, very critical so that people are willing to cross the chasm but the interesting thing about that process is that it's a very complex process. So once you build a vision community, the third requirement for a leader is to be able to do change management, huge amount of change management. And during that course of change management, when a lot of you know, uh, subversion might take place, uh, there could be questions, there could be uh, certain amount of uh, you know desire to go back to where we came from so when all that churn happens the leader must be at hand to manage the process in that process the most critical thing becomes uh, sense making uh, there was a time when we used to think that the leader is a person who stands up and say give me your blood certain tears and i'll give you freedom people are pretty much capable of uh, managing that process of change. But more than ever before today, people are saying, we have the inputs, we have access to information. Once we realize what is our entitlement, we will get there. But along the way, we need a sense maker, not a direction giver. So the leader's job is to do a lot of sense making. Last but not the least, I think the leader's job is to be able to build leadership capacity. Because any long-acting change process would require not the bison herd leadership style. You know, when the settlers came in, uh, they had all they had to do was to manage the alpha male bison, mm -hmm. and uh, managing meant you shot the bison down, and then everybody else froze. So that kind of leadership, the alpha male kind of leadership is pretty much gone. And now the leadership style is more like the migrating birds that keep coming to Florida, right? Mm -hmm. From all the way in Canada. And they're changing who the leader of the formation is as they're flying. So today's leadership style is more collegial. And today's leadership style is more fractal. And you require different uh, horses for different courses. Now step back whose job it is to anticipate the issues at hand or issues that could be at hand tomorrow and build the leadership capacity for it. So the leader is a person who has a view of the future, is able to create a vision. A leader is a person who is then able to create a vision community. Then as people do their 
walk across the chasm. The leader is the person who is doing change management and of which one big component is to be a sense maker. And last but not the least, the leader's job is to create more leadership. Fantastic. What are the greatest challenges you faced as a leader? Um, you know, it's interesting uh, when you look back, it looks like a smooth curve. <laughs> and uh, only when you detach and you, you begin to get some wisdom, and uh, that comes with loss of hair, okay, uh, you begin to realize that you were actually truly standing at a fork at more than a couple of times in your life. Um, in, for me, uh, I think uh, the first challenge was, first big challenge was when I uh, had to move in, abandoning my dreams to be a teacher and a researcher to joining the private sector. And uh, that was a long time ago. I started life uh, in a, uh, don't laugh at me, in a textile mill, in a textile factory, uh, when I was all about um, 18 plus years of age. And I was certainly thrown into a position of leadership in some sense to work with workers uh, on the shop floor of this plant. And uh, here I come, you know, a young uh, boy of no more than 18 or 19. And these are people two times, three times older than me. And many of them were uh, high school dropouts. So working with them, uh, I realized empathy is very important and very critical. It's not about, um, you know, uh, it's not about your figuring out uh, what is good for your people. But it's not about process. A lot of people try to reduce things to process. And I keep saying that, look, process is important, but even more important is empathy. Uh, so the idea of empathetic leaders leadership came to me while working with people who don't sometimes speak your language. Uh, that was an interesting challenge to 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 melt into your people and then look at them as human beings even before looking at them as organizational constructs, organizational components. The second uh, big challenge was uh, when I co-founded my first startup and I was all about 28 years old and it folded up in three years time. But I learned a lot of important lessons in there. And uh, uh, the most important lessons had to do with, uh, uh, you know, keeping your people's faith going even when things are collapsing. And uh, knowing when to get out of something. Uh, it's not easy. I find a lot of leaders struggle with it. Uh, it's important to get in, but it's sometimes even more important to get out. Uh, because you're dealing with people, you're dealing with employees, you're dealing with uh, customers, you're dealing with other stakeholders. And uh, our job, unlike what people say or think, is not to take risks. Our job is to de-risk risk. So choosing the, op the right moment to walk out of something that you created uh, was uh, not an easy thing. The third major challenge happened when you know, I was chief executive of an, of an R&D team. Um, I was the only non-engineer in there. And the entire R&D team was, uh, was consisting of very proud people who had built uh, a lot of engineering greatness. But it was all focused on a domestic market. Uh, I used to work for a company in India at that time. And the domestic market was going to go away. It was going to be part of a global market now. So you had the IBMs and the DEX and the Compacts all just getting in there. And he was a company's R&D that was creating products for the domestic market, which meant that the cost of R&D was being uh, amortized over a small piece of market. And suddenly you had the global giants coming in mm -hmm. who were able to amortize their R&D over the entire world. So the choice was either to close this R&D down or to open it up as a contract R&D. Like, you know, think of it as a, a global lab on hire. But the moment I tried to do that, you know, people didn't want to get there. You know, people didn't want to see the green buck. People said it's a sellout. So to create the atmosphere in which they were even willing to understand that the existence was at stake 
was a big challenge for me. And they saw me as the enemy. They saw me as the guy from the other side, okay? But it was interesting uh, to get them over to see that there was, you know, um, there was a beneficial uh, thing waiting for them at the end. And this goes back to definition of leadership. You know, you mm -hmm. build a leadership community, I mean, sorry, a vision community. So this was my big challenge in creating a vision community. The next great challenge came uh, very recently. You know, I co-founded Mindtree 15 years back, and it was a dream, and um, it was 1999, and the dream went sour. Um, no, the dream never went sour. The environment went sour when 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And the big challenge was to keep the faith. Uh, and we had less than 500 people at that time. Uh, and, uh, you know, one day I you know, realized that 9-11 uh, uh, has happened. And it caught everybody by surprise, mm -hmm. as all of us know. Business came to a standstill. Uh, everybody was uncertain as to what would happen uh, to the future uh, of the world. Forget about the future of business and forget then about the future of a startup that you have co-created. But to be able to create uh, a situation where people believe there will be a tomorrow, okay, that even the bad times will pass. And here you're dealing with a generation uh, that was not, uh, not uh, not prepared, not trained for, no script existed because the last big thing, the last big downturn that people realized when the world almost came to a standstill was during World War. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly you have a generation who have to deal with what they have on hand. So that was challenging. But even more challenging was very recent in Mindtree where we had a near-death experience. And for the first time, we had some of the top people disagree over the path that they had to take for the future. And you know, when you disagree as a top team, sometimes it could be a near-death experience. So somebody has to take a call and somebody has to say that one of the key requirements, rather two of the key requirements for leadership, where leadership truly, you know, uh, uh, truly meets, uh, meets its, uh, uh, its, its uh, challenging moments. One is when you are required to uh, exercise, uh, you know, the responsibility of dissent. It's not the right to dissent, but the responsibility mm -hmm. of dissent. And many times we don't do that because we get carried away in groupthink. Uh, we are too shy to s raise our voice. We don't want to seem like the traitor. Uh, now, the responsibility of dissent comes from uh, one of the most important requirements to be a leader, and that is about the the. the need to ask critical questions. So critical questioning and the responsibility of dissent when dissent must be exercised um, becomes very challenging because for the first time it's no longer about the company, it's no longer about the organization, it's about people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's about people that you've walked almost a lifetime to build something and suddenly you're face to face and said, no, I don't think so. I think there's a very different future that we want to work towards. And it's not normal dissent. You're basically saying, um, if depending on whether we're going this way or this way, it's almost like sometimes ending personal relationships. Mm. It can be very hurtful. Those are some of the challenges. Mm. You've articulated some great aspects of leadership. How did your education prepare you to demonstrate those attributes? You know, I'm going to talk about it in the commencement tomorrow. Um, sometimes your education prepares you, sometimes it doesn't prepare you. Um, you know, I was educated to be uh, a teacher in humanities. That is what I wanted to do. And very interestingly, I landed up working for, in the beginning, factories, and then the information technology revolution happened. And I found that I'm a student of political science and I was hanging out with R&D engineers. I was the least educated person in that setting. And all my life since then, I have only spent in the company of engineers. So, um, you know, um, I, I am an outsider, uh, outsider and an insider at the same time. Uh, so I had two educations. One education was a formal education, which looking back was a shorter spell and there's a huge, large 
lifelong education. Because you know, information technology industry is very knowledge driven. Mm -hmm. And every day you come to work, uh, it is like, you know, it is like a classroom without walls. So you're learning all the time. And that education today is probably, okay, let me put it this way. I think um, I'm, I'm an engineer today, okay? Uh, as much as I was a student of humanities. So how did it prepare me? Uh, the humanities uh, made me to uh, look at broader set of issues. I like what uh, you know was once coined, I think in the Stanford University where they said the people for the future would be T personalities. Mm -hmm. So you will have a width of uh, knowledge and experience, but you also need a kind of one mile deep kind of uh, mm -hmm. personality. So my education helped me uh, to build a T personality and I think I'm a T person. Mm -hmm. What other methods of leadership development were important in your growth as a leader? You know, I'm going to harp on one, just one, so that it registers, because the Japanese say uh, one is always best, you know. Uh, so what's that one thing? The one thing is about learning from unusual sources. As we grew up in life as adults, we continue to go back to known ways and known sources of learning. That's not gonna work. So I think we need to find learning in not just adjacent sources, not by looking at competition, not by looking at best practices of people around us across the street, but actually look at completely unconnected forces. Because a change is happening, the future is unfolding itself through those forces. And uh, I think Peter Drucker, uh, the management guru, saw it uh, coming first, and he articulated it um, in the context of profit versus non-profit. And he had said famously that the for-profit sector has a more to learn from the not-for-profit sector than the other way around. So what that really means is that uh, all of us have to connect to the universe uh, and that universe is not your and my universe. That universe has to be completely, you know, completely away from our universe. Mm -hmm. And it also helps us to, as leaders, uh, to create a white space around us. Uh, when you are in that universe, you are without chains, you are without mental shackles, and you are willing to go with the openness, and you're willing to reset uh, your button of uh, you know whatever mental con construct that you have. So don't just go across the street, don't just look at competitive benchmarking. Um, go and talk to a kindergarten teacher. Mm. Go and talk to a doctor if you're an engineer. Go and you know, go to a country where you are least likely to do business and talk to a hole-in-a-wall mom-and-pop shopkeeper and ask that person what's engaging you. The next big thing will come from there because engineering is a mind thing. Mm -hmm. And your mind is capable of expanding in unusual new ways provided you are willing to go to unusual new sockets of knowledge, wisdom, experience, and energy that is all around you in the universe. Go to somebody else's universe. Mm -hmm. Great advice, get out of your comfort zone. What advice would you give to students who want to become great leaders? Uh, I, I would repeat that um, build empathy. Uh, people will tell you that uh, leadership is about courage, leadership is about vision, uh, leadership is about a lot many things. But I think uh, the time for empathetic leadership is here. It's going to be there for a long time. And the good news is empathy comes naturally to today's young people. Mm. Because they're so connected. So they're so, that their virality uh, is based on uh, a deep concern for what is fair and uh, what is unfair. Uh, so connection comes naturally. But empathy goes beyond connection. Empathy is about 
not just you know putting up the like thumbs up okay mm -hmm. empathy is about stepping into the shoe of the individual is feeling for who that person is uh, sometimes you don't meet that person so i always talk to my people and say you have your customer your your known customer then you have your unknown customer then you have your customer with stated experience your customer with unstated experiences i mean ex unstated uh, expectations mm -hmm. then you have the unknown customer and if you can put your finger on the unknown customer's unstated expectation then you will laugh all the way to bank mm -hmm. but that comes from deep empathy mm -hmm. uh, i would argue that uh, you know um, if you look at the biggest innovators in the world mm -hmm. uh, they had they started from empathy you deeply felt about somebody you deeply felt about something and that's very empathic empathetic you know we tend to reduce engineering to left brain thinking to if then else uh, but uh, at the end of the day uh, the world is about feelings the world is about emotion and if you look at the word emotion uh, there are two components to it the e and then the motion mm. okay and the word uh, emotion actually has latin uh, roots where the meaning is an emotion is a thought that pushes you moves you that's why the motion okay so emotive thinking empathetic thinking is very important to tomorrow's brand of leadership fascinating what can universities do to support leadership development uh, i think the universities particularly like yours are doing a phenomenal job and i continuously um, gain insights and i gain a uh, lot of uh, inspiration when i come to places like the university of florida um because you are seeing uh, more change than we do and you flow you flow with change you don't see change as an adversary uh, because you know you're destined to turn over your uh, student population every year uh, you're destined to have these people talk to you in a different language and different expectations uh, they will challenge you very differently whereas we in the industry uh, we we try to make things as static as predictable as possible you don't seek friendship with predictability so i think inherently you are doing a phenomenal job of uh, you know being comfortable with change and building leadership uh, i was uh, looking at some of the questions that for example the students of your engineering school asked me when i said i don't want to deliver your commencement speech because it's your commencement you decide what you want to hear from me and the kind of questions that they have thrown at me has kept me awake at night for mm -hmm. many many weeks now and i was telling you about that uh, a little while ago so for uh, you to have produced those minds i think uh, you're doing an exceedingly uh, exceedingly commendable work what could you do more um i think um i think it's important for uh the universities of tomorrow to uh help people to connect the different parts of their brain together uh to be right brain and left brain at the same time to be big picture thinking and focus on the small deliverable at the same time uh, to make a uh, people feel that it is okay to be intuitive this innovation is an intuitive process and how do we do that we do that by again going back to the point i made uh, i i made about learning from unusual sources and i think tomorrow's university is a fractal university is a is a, is a distributed university a connected university and sometimes connected distributed fractalized uh, over very unusual uh, geographies unusual horizons and unusual places um to come to specifics um i think the university of tomorrow uh, would need to engage with the idea of leadership uh, by looking at leaders uh, from very unusual sectors mm -hmm. and bringing them in and creating a way of engaging with them on an on in an ongoing manner i think if we deliver that we'll be in good shape great advice 
How has globalization impacted leadership? Oh, it is actually, globalization today is uh, putting leadership uh, ideas on, uh, on their head. Uh, I, I think of three, four things. It's a deep question you ask. Uh, I think the most important thing that's happening is uh, there's a paradigm shift. Yesterday's leader settled the issues on behalf of our people. I, the leader, or you, the leader, decide that, look, this is the issue we need to engage with. Today, people decide pretty much what issues they would like to be engaged with. And this is not just in an engineering sense or an organizational sense. It is in a global sense. So you look at, uh, you know, the uprising that the world is seeing in different parts, political uprisings, economic uprisings, and there a whole, whole sea of humanity is coming up and saying, you leader, this is what matters most to us. And this is happening in even non-democratic societies. Mm -hmm. okay. But lead people are coming in new ways using technology to kind of raise issues up and then saying, if you are leader enough, help us to do sense making, help us to understand our true entitlement and help us to get aligned and action and build a future which is a very different paradigm. The interesting thing is they're not doing this to just geographically proximate leadership. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Arab Spring is determining the priority for the American president. Mm -hmm. The Ukrainian uh, crisis that we're dealing with today is what is engaging the top leadership of the world. It's not the domestic priority anymore. You have to build a point of view. You have to, you know, you have to say where, which, which side do you stand? Wha in what way will you engage? In what way will you commit resources? So more and more people are deciding the issues. The second very interesting thing, and this is dangerous, is that uh, in the earlier, earlier world, Leadership was a very organizational thing. So I work for you in your department, okay? And so you are my leader. I look up to you, and most of my leadership needs mm -hmm. are getting fulfilled by my engagement through you. So it makes your job easy because then you are focused on you and me and nothing in between. The leadership challenges are between a leader and a people. Now comes a flat world and a world which is information rich which is you know media is pervasive the internet is pervasive and I am a 25 year old I know how to get in all there and I suddenly I, I suddenly decide that you are not the only leader mm -hmm. I may work for you but I follow the leadership precepts of maybe another leader in another business organization, another leader who's got nothing to do with the world of business, but it comes from a world of music, mm -hmm. okay? So leadership is, you know, leadership needs and leadership personalities are being determined more and more by the follower. And the time is over that I had just one iconic leader now, I could be actually switching from one leader to another leader. And the wall between professional and the personal is breaking down. Mm -hmm. What does this do to people like you and me who think that our job is the job of a leader? And now if you know, leadership is available on demand, where does your job and my job go? It makes it very challenging. Okay, which means that we can no longer engage with our own people in a unidimensional way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for me to provide engineering leadership to my own organization would be by providing political leadership, by speaking the language of music and sport and yet something else. Mm -hmm. Okay, So we have to uh, actually uh, help our people to crisscross a whole world of information abundance and work with the idea that there could be multiple leaders. 
Now, which brings me to the idea of capacity building. Uh, in the past, the iconic leader uh, had to lead. But in today's globalized world, we have to build leadership capacity more than ever before. Mm -hmm. So the job of the leader is no longer to lead, but to create leaders. Mm -hmm. So we have to fractalize the idea of leadership. And in different parts of the geography, I have to have different leadership capability so that they have the proximity to engage locally, which is very different. So the headquarter idea of leadership is gone. Uh, the other very interesting point that uh, when you ask me this question that comes to my mind is um, so um, in this new world where all this is going to happen, what is the other big challenge? The other big challenge is in terms of the very first deliverable of leadership and that in my mind is building proximity. Some leaders appear proximate and some leaders appear remote. And people don't like remote leaders. So when the world is 24 by seven, when your people are dispersed all over the world, how do you be available to them on demand, on call? Okay, how do you become 24 by seven? The only way you can do that is by making technology a friend. So if I'm a G worker in China, I probably learn more about G's leadership philosophy by downloading a Jeff Emelt video from YouTube mm -hmm. and watching that video at my time and my space. Now this throws the own ownership of being available onto Jeff Emelt in a very different way because now two things become very important which was not as important in the old world. One is, um, you know, to be able to create content. More and more leadership will be content driven. Mm -hmm. Because when you are able to build content, whether it's in terms of a white paper, a point of view document, or a video on YouTube, you're basically giving hands and legs to ideas. When you create content, you create legacy. And you, when you create content, your content starts moving. Which brings me to the last point, and that point is about thought leadership. You cannot create content which is empty. Mm. You know, today the leader has to have a lot more thought leadership. Okay. So you lead with thought. You lead with content. You lead by being available to people through the medium that they're most most comfortable with, at the time that they're most comfortable with. So those are some of the interesting challenges that globalization is bringing. The other very important thing globalization is making, uh, the need for humanity and leadership uh, stronger than ever before. It's not enough today to be able, it's not enough today to be Intel, uh, and making the best semiconductor chips because uh, uh, people are beginning to question about use of problematic materials. So Intel must engage with those issues. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to be uh, selling coffee at Starbucks. People want to know what are your fair trade practices. How do you engage with farmers? How are you looking at rainforest issues? You know, how do you look at issues related to the greenhouse effect? So more and more globalization is making um, problems and the solutions uh, very interdisciplinary. So which means that as students, as leaders in the making, as engineer leaders, will have to take into cognizance some of these unfolding issues. If I could follow up on, on one aspect that you touched on earlier, this concept of diffused leadership. In the past, corporate culture was determined by the hierarchical leadership structure. How will corporate cultures or organizational cultures be determined in the future? Will it be more organic or is there an opportunity to use the content that you discussed as a way to shape a, an organization's culture? You know, nobody wants to work with a plastic organization, plastic as in the material, mm -hmm. uh, in, in a fixed sense. Though the word plastic is very interesting because we're saying in the um, 
in the context of the brain that the brain is plastic. What that means is mm -hmm. moldable. But here when I talk about plastic, I'm talking about the plasticky feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to touch something that feels organic. You don't want to touch something that feels, uh, feels lifeless. Mm -hmm. So being organic in terms of organizational design in terms of communication, in terms of interpersonal relationships is becoming very, very critical. There's no question about it. Um, so going back to your question, I think uh, we, in, in some ways we are becoming large, in some ways we are becoming distributed, in some ways we are becoming fractal, uh, multidisciplinary, but what does not go away is the importance of being organic, importance of bringing life into everything. What key events or people were instrumental in putting you on the path to leadership? Well, actually, um, I, I'm an extremely good student. And I have been very lucky to have mentors at different uh, periods of my life. And different people, uh, kind of angels have appeared out of nowhere at every inflection point in my life. It's very difficult to name uh, if just a few individuals because uh, they have kind of come at the appropriate time, uh, stayed with me till you know I have reached the next stage and then ameliorated um, into, uh, into the background and newer ones have come. Um, what, what, what I'm taking with that conversation is that it's very important to understand that in your life uh, you won't have one mentor, then you are static. So you will have to make space for uh, not many mentors at the same time, but definitely you have to understand that in different parts of your life, in your 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, you must have the capacity to receive from different people. So you need to build the capacity to receive. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the capacity to receive is more important than the capacity to give. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of high achievers struggle and fall by the wayside uh, at very critical junctures in their life because uh, they did not nurture the capacity to receive. Now, having said all that, I think uh, we all come into very close proximity to our own parents early in life. And there's no substitute to your parents being leaders. But we leave our parents, um, those close intimate uh, moments to the you know, early days of our life and then we move on. But we, many of us don't revisit and say, so what was, uh, what was between the lines there? What was in the white space? And when I did so as an adult, I found that two things uh, were very fundamental in terms of leadership capability that I imbibed. My father would always say that uh, you must leave the newspaper the way that you expect to see it the first time. You don't crumple up and leave your newspaper. Even if you're in a commuter train, you just read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. How about folding it neatly so that the next person uh, is able to find it the way that it would look fresh? And just as my father taught me that, my mother, who became blind later in her life, uh, whenever she went, we lived in uh, transient government uh, quarters, dwellings, mm -hmm. and we changed them every year, literally. I went to some seven or eight schools. Mm -hmm. But every place she would go to, uh, in the decrepit government quarter, she would build a garden. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, just as the flowers were ready to bloom, it was time to move on. So people would say to her, why do you take pain to, you know, build a garden when you know that you're going to go away. So she would always say that, look, uh, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, w whatever I'm leaving behind must be in better shape than I, that I inherited. So if I look at these as leadership lessons, between what I learned from my father and my mother, it really shows us the, the idea of legacy. A leader who does not have a sense of legacy is no leader. So a leader 
must be enchanted with the idea of leaving something behind. So how do you want to leave that something behind? You want to leave it behind in much better shape than you inherited it. Mm -hmm. It could be a department, it could be a university, it could be a startup, it could be a Fortune 500 company, it could be the Oval Office. How did you get it? And how is it after you're gone? Wonderful advice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thanks, Kami. Thank you.